Hello and welcome to another episode of Dog Talk Beverly Hills. My name is Ariel and we're here with Dr. Katzen. Hi, Dr. Katzen. Hi, Ariel. So today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the truth behind medical school and what your experience was like. Now, we want you to be honest here. We want you to tell us about your actual experience. And if things have changed, then your, your opinion on that. But tell us about your experience and if you would recommend it to others. Yeah, so, I mean, the way I look at medical school, medical school is very hard. If you look at... Um, you know, getting into a good university, you've got to try really, really hard in high school. You got to take the hardest classes. You got to take uh, the SATs. You got to do very, very well in the SATs. You got to do very well in all your classes and do all the extracurricular activities just to get in a good college. So once you get in a good college, then you got to take all the pre-med classes, and those are usually the hardest classes, usually in college. And you've got to do not only very well in those classes, you've got to do exceedingly well and pass those classes. So it's a very rigorous um, protocol. You know, I always bump it to people, oh yeah, you know, I was thinking about going to medical school. Well, they didn't because they couldn't get into the classes or maybe they did the classes and failed. You know? So it's a, it's a huge commitment on your part. It's a huge commitment time-wise, uh, financially, and relationship-wise, you know, those components and with your family, too. You're not going to see your family for a lot of time because you're going to be spending that time studying. Wow. Okay, so let's just actually explain this to people, average people like myself, who don't know much about medical school. So you first have to take the MCAT to get in, right? Yeah. So during, during high school, uh -huh. um, you're supposed to take all the advanced classes. Not just like advanced, like all of the AP, advanced mm -hmm. placement classes. So you take as many AP classes as you can. I think... No, thinking back years now, I think I probably had uh, six or seven AP classes in my senior year. So in my senior year, like 95% of my classes were college-level classes. And you'd have exams on all those. And you'd be taking your SATs to get into college, mm -hmm. okay? And then during college, you're taking pre-med classes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so during college, your undergraduate, you're yeah. taking pre-med classes. Pre-med classes. And, and then, you have to pass those. You have to pass those, or you can't you know, even apply to medical school. So not only do you have to pass those, you have to like get A's and B's to be competitive to apply to medical school. And it's not just like, oh yeah, you know, introduction to chemistry. I mean, these are like organic chemistry and biochemistry, physics, AP physics, you know, really hardcore um, foundation blocks to go into medical school. Okay, so let's say you successfully pass these is that kind of a good sign that you'll do well in medical school or on the MCAT? Yeah, it's a good sign that you'll do well. I mean, that's why we have the courses. But I distinctly remember in medical school, you know, we take all these classes during undergrad and, you know, undergrad usually, undergraduate college is usually four years and you take all these classes pre-med, you know, throughout those all four years. And I remember going to medical school and I promise you within about the first three weeks of medical school, all the material in the past four years had been covered. So then, like, you're spending the rest of your three and a three-quarter years at medical school, all brand new information, but at the same volume, oh. at the same intensity. So you're like, the analogy as people talk about it is, le it's like getting knowledge, like drinking water out of a fire hydrant. It's just coming at you so much, so fast, and you have to absorb all that information. Okay, so let's break this up to the MCAT now. What advice yeah. do you have for people studying for that? Oh, studying for any standardized test, I would highly suggest a standardized test prep course. There are a variety of courses out there now. Um, they're both textbook, and they're both in classroom, and they're also interview one-on-one. -on -one. I highly suggest you take those. So everybody can do well taking the test, okay? But you can do even better by taking these cram courses. Is it difficult to pass, would you say? Ah, uh, you get a score. So there's not a pass-fail, there's a score. So by doing the course, by concentrating, by, you know, knowing your stuff, you should get a decent score. Okay. Now, let's say we get accepted into medical school. Okay. You, you already said that they crammed through all that stuff within the first, like, three weeks. Yep. How difficult is the rest of medical school? Very difficult. I mean, the way I look at it, it's medical school. When I went through college, the smartest, the hardest courses were the pre-med courses. That's what everybody was doing. Yeah, there's engineering, there's pre-law, there are other classes, and I'm sure those are very hard. But when I went through, the hardest thing you could do 
was go pre-med. But when I went through, the first year was sort of everything normal. So normal physiology, normal chemistry, normal anatomy, everything, the normal body structures. And then second year was all the abnormal stuff. So what could go wrong with physiology? What could go wrong with your kidneys? What could go wrong with your liver? Psychiatry, what could go wrong with your brain? Anatomy, what could go wrong with the anatomic structures? And then third year was clinical, where you actually go in the hospital and you see patients and you're actually engaged as a junior doctor. And then fourth year is more of a junior doctor and you get to choose electives as you apply to your specialty, your residency. And so let's talk a little bit about what you did when you were going through the third and fourth year. So third and fourth year, basically uh, the electives. So when I went to medical school, I wanted to be a pediatrician. I thought pediatrics was going to be great. I love treating kids. But as I went through my third year of residency, that's when you get exposed to more the reality of medicine. I sort of experienced the medical treatment versus the surgical treatment. The medical treatment in my mind is writing prescriptions, diagnosing a disease, and writing things down to treat things, mm -hmm. okay? Whether it's internal medicine, as opposed to surgical fields where you're actually using your hands to treat things. And I loved a variety of fields. I loved uh, cardiothoracic surgery, thought that was fantastic. I loved OBGYN, loved delivering babies. I loved the surgical intervention, loved neurosurgery. I thought that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then sort of decided uh, during my third year, I wanted to become a uh, surgeon and wanted to specialize in surgery. So as a general exposure, I decided to go into general surgery to get the maximum exposure to the most surgeries that I could uh, assess. One of the things I liked the best was burn surgery. So I specialized in burn surgery. And then as I went through burn surgery, really fell in love with plastic surgery. So is this like your third year of medical school still, or is this after that? That's after. Okay. So third year medical school, basically you're exposed to almost all the fields that your medical school can uh -huh. expose you to. Usually the blocks are a month, a month long. So ideally you'd get exposed to, you know, between 10 and 12 fields of medicine. Mm -hmm. Pediatrics, internal medicine, psychiatry, surgery of some realm. And then during your third year, you can sort of say, oh, okay, I like that one best. And then your fourth year of medical school, that's the specialty you apply to. Okay, got it. So once you're done with medical school, then you go into residency? Then you go into residency. And usually your first year of residency is called an internship. Internship and first year of residency are the same thing. Okay. All right. Uh, so it's intern, resident, you'd be a second year resident, and depending on how long your residency is, then you become specialized in that area. And then if you want to get another specialty on top of that, then you get a thing, what's called a fellowship. Fellowship is sort of after all your training is done for extra specialty mm -hmm. fellowship, to extra area concentration. Okay, so, so can you talk a little bit more about your pathway that you took? Yeah, so my pathway was uh, general surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, then within general surgery, I love burn surgery. So I did a burn fellowship. And you can do that after your general surgery. You can specialize in burns and do a burn fellowship. So I did a burn fellowship for a year, just doing burns 24-7 all the time. Whether it's a chemical burn, you get poured on with chemicals, you get a flash burn, uh, you get uh, something poured on you, and it burns. And then during that burn fellowship, I really love plastic surgery. I sort of said, wow, you know, burns is great. And I was going to do burn surgery for the rest of my life, but I realized that plastic surgery is really cool and you can do more with plastic surgery than you can just with burn surgery. Mm -hmm. So I decided I wanted to do plastic surgery, but bef when you apply for plastic surgery, there is a one-year lag of when you can get in. Mm -hmm. So you apply and you don't get in the next year. You get in a year following that. Okay. So I applied and I had a year of flexibility, so I decided to do another specialty which I love is microsurgery and hand surgery. So in that, basically, it's operating under a microscope and you have this huge microscope, like as big as this room, million dollar, multi-million dollar thing, and you're attaching nerves together. You're attaching fingers back on, you're putting thumbs back on, you're sometimes putting hands and arms back on. So you're reattaching things under the microscope. And so I had all that experience and then started plastic surgery residency. And when I went through my plastic surgery residency, it was two years long. And then during my plastic surgery residency, look, I'd already been exposed and been a specialist in burn surgery, microsurgery, and hand surgery. So I had a very good feel of plastic surgery even before I started plastic surgery. 
So within plastic surgery, you get exposed to a lot of different stuff. In plastic surgery, there are basically two avenues, two main divisions. Reconstructive surgery, which is taking the human body and returning it to normal. And then aesthetic surgery, which is basically taking a normal body and making it super normal, mm -hmm. if you will. Okay, and then... Yeah. After that, you became a plastic surgeon? Yeah, okay. No, even, I mean, even right after I finished my plastic surgery residency, then technically you're a plastic surgeon. So plastic surgery sort of has a vague term out there. Uh, strictly speaking, only board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery can call themselves plastic surgeons. Now, unfortunately, a lot of uh, people out there are calling themselves plastic surgeons just because they do aesthetic surgery. So aesthetic surgery means cosmetic surgery, but Almost any MD can call themselves legally a cosmetic surgeon. And unfortunately, there's a lot of confusion between cosmetic surgeons and plastic surgeons. So plastic surgeons are the only board approved by the American Board of Specialties as a legitimate board for plastic surgery. And is that a certain test you have to take, or is that with the residency? Oh, that's with the residency and tests. There's a written test that you got to pass, and you got to recertify every five years, and an oral test. The oral test is brutal. You sit in the room with specialists from all over the U.S., sometimes outside the country too, and they grill you on this, how you treated this patient, what went wrong, why you did what you did. You know, they're the experts, and they're asking you to defend your position on these. So it's incredibly intense. And even now, after you've done this multiple times, it's still hard for you, intense? Yeah, I mean, that, that level of intensity, you know, is brutal because they have you in a room, and they're grilling you, and you got three or four people grilling you about your case, and how you handle that case. And uh, it's very difficult. So yeah. basically they don't go easier on you just because you're a veteran. No way, they go extra hard on you because they don't necessarily want you to pass. They want to make sure that you know your material. Oh my goodness, yeah. wow, that's intense. Yeah. So let's say um, from like medical school till the end of residency till like, till now, when was the most difficult time for you? Well, there are different kinds of difficulty, right? Difficult uh, reasons? So. Yeah, I mean, in high school and college, you're always studying, just always studying. Medical school, you're always studying, but it's at a different level. Like all your friends are studying at that same pace. You're all cramming, you're studying 24 seven. Uh, and then residency is a little bit different. That's more, you're studying, but there's also a physicality to it. Because you're always... You're on call. So you're always in the operating room. You know, during my general surgery, I'd get to the hospital at 4 a.m. And I'd leave like at about, you know, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Every single day. Sometimes you'd live... They call it residency because you're a resident in the hospital. You like live in the hospital. You like sleep in the hospital. That's why they call it residency. Mm -hmm. Way back when, you know, generation before me the residents would live in the hospital. They would give you a room and they'd give you food and that's the way it was and you wouldn't go home. You were a resident of the hospital. That's, Is this seven days what, a week? Seven days a week. Sometimes for years. For sometimes for years. That's why oh. they call it a residence. And that's why relationships and you don't get a lot of time with family and yeah, I mean, so holidays. It doesn't matter because it doesn't you're, matter. Still you're, you're still a resident. You, holidays don't really count. You don't, oh get, you don't get that time off. It's, every day is Monday. Have you watched Grey's Anatomy at all? <laughs> no, I haven't. I'm just curious no, if any of it's accurate. The, um, I know they have a very good medical editor who does the editing for that show, and I've heard it's very good. Um, but I, I, it's hard to explain the physical nature and the brutality, brutality of it. They've changed a lot of the laws since I've been through to make the hours a little bit more accommodating. But at least in surgery... In surgery, you need to see the progression of it. So you need to see, unfortunately, somebody come in the emergency room and, oh, you know, doc, I, you know, I have a little, I have a little pain in my abdomen, mm -hmm. to the point of where the appendix bursts, the uh, the intestines are completely spilled inside the peritoneal cavity. They are septic. They are like life. They're barely hanging on. You got know, to take them to the operating room and clean them out. You got to see that continuum. If you just come in and say, oh, hi, nice to meet you and then find out the next day the patient died, you know, that's a misstep on your uh, end because you didn't track the patient, you didn't follow the patient from the beginning to the end to see what could happen. And that's what residency was all that's about, what residency was teaching about. you that. Seeing that continuum, seeing that spectrum, and then exposure to as many possible things as you would see in private practice. Wow, and how would you say private practice is compared to all that? Yeah, private practice is different. Uh, when you finish uh, residency, there are many routes you can go. There is private practice, which is on your own, as opposed to maybe a university setting 
where uh, the university sort of takes care of you uh, in terms of, you know, getting the secretary, getting the scheduling, uh, getting you the patients, uh, handling insurance, handling billing, and basically they give you a salary. So that has its own advantages and disadvantages. In private practice, you basically have to handle all of it by yourself. Or if you're with a partner, as a partner. Basically, you have to handle scheduling and staffing and hiring and uh, insurance and billing and all that. And what in the world made you decide to do that? Yeah, uh, for me, again, it's a personal choice. I mean, some people much prefer in a university setting. For me, I just, uh, I prefer private practice. Just a little bit more independent. I can do exactly what I want to do. I can treat patients the way I want to uh, treat patients as opposed to be dictated by an insurance company saying, look, you know, you can't do this procedure because it's too expensive. Yeah, that, that doesn't sit well. You take out the politics of it and you're a hero. Yeah, I treat patients one-on-one, -on -one, you know, as I would want to as if I were a patient. Okay, well that's good to know. Yeah. Are you happy? Are you proud of where you are? Uh, yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of work. I mean, uh, don't, don't expect, oh, Beverly Hills plastic surgeon, oh wow, it must be living the life. No, it's a lot of brutal work. You lose a lot of friends, you lose a lot of social life, you lose a lot of family. A lot of time. Time you don't get back. You don't get that back. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're willing to put in all that time uh, to get to this position, yeah, do it. But, you know, if there's anything else you've thought about or wanted to do, do that instead because I guarantee it's much easier. Guaranteed. Yeah, because you work a lot of hours. A lot of hours, yeah. yeah. And you wake up early. Yep. And you eat the same breakfast every day, which I think is a personal choice, but I mean... Uh... Well, I yeah. mean, I mean, it works for you, so it works for me. It holds it's you over. Yeah. Do you want to tell them your secret, your secret breakfast? Egg whites. I do a cup of egg whites. Um, maybe like about a third of a cup of half and half. Six cherry tomatoes, chia seeds, tablespoon of um, Parmesan cheese, and you can go for probably fourteen hours. Is this, or at least like, I can. is this like a mix of them? Are they all cooked together? Or? I don't cook them together. I've done multiple experiments. Uh, you cook the egg whites by themselves uh -huh. with the half and half. Cook that together. Oh, it's for a little creaminess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you take it out. Then you do the rest of the stuff. A little guacamole too. Sometimes it's good. Like yeah. how much guacamole? Uh, like probably, I would say like a quarter to a third of a cup. Okay. Yeah. All right. Again, so high protein, high protein, mm -hmm. low carbs. Okay. Yeah, and that's pretty much the diet you try to live yep. by, right? Yeah, intermittent fasting is good. Um, depends on your age as to how long you should fast for, but uh, probably, you know, aim for 12, 14, 16, 18 hours. Is it like the younger you are, the longer you should fast? Correct, okay. correct. The younger you are, probably the longer you should fast. Probably even can skip days, which is kind of cool if you're brave. <laughs> but yeah, there'll be often days where I'm like, Eh, would I rather go to bed or would I rather eat? And a lot of the times it'll be, I'd rather just go to bed. So just go to bed. Hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> if you guys have any more questions about medical school, residency, any of that, owning a private practice, please contact us at 310-859-7770 and Dr. Katzen will gladly answer all those questions. Yep. Honestly, brutally and honestly. Brutal. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks all right. so much for sharing your experiences. I think the viewers will love to hear all that. Okay, okay. All right, well, we'll see you guys next week. All right. Bye.